we're, we're good to start now. At least we have half of our speakers here. And, uh, and I'm sure Mark will be very happy to entertain you for a full hour if, uh, if our other speaker is, is long delayed. My name's Will Wakeling. I'm the Acting Dean of Libraries here at Northeastern, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here for the first of this season's Library Meet the Authors talks. Uh, I want to thank the members of the Library's Programming and Communications Committee for organizing the event. And of course, I want to thank our good friends at the NU Bookstore who co-sponsor the event and with whom we always uh, enjoy working. If you've not been to one of these events before, let me tell you about the Meet the Author series. It showcases authors whose works address current events or preoccupations as well as social issues, and it brings faculty and students and staff together to discuss these issues in an open forum. You can support our programs in the library very practically become, by becoming a member of our library supporters group. And you can find out more about that from talking to people from the library here today or looking at our website. OK, so we've got a wonderful event to start the season today, really timely. Two New England authors uh, who, uh, with, for those with an interest in, in football at least, uh, can't fail to fascinate. Aaron Schatz and Mark Bavaro. Uh, I'll introduce Mark and, and let him loose on you, uh, and then we'll introduce Aaron when he arrives, OK? So Mark Bavaro's playing credentials are not in doubt in the light of his stellar all pro career, primarily with the New York Giants, a team, of course, we now all love to hate. Um, and he could do this in spite of being brought up in the Boston area, playing his high school football at Danvers, and still living close at hand. Boxford, I think you said. Right. The Sunday Times had this to say last week um, about Mark. I quote, Say this for Mark Bavaro's breezy debut novel, Rough and Tumble, St. Martin's Press, 2495. There will be opportunities, by the way, to get a signed copy after, after the event. It's undoubtedly the best work of fiction ever to begin, quote, H slot out Z motion, 62 semi Y hook Z flag on two on two. I've always wanted to say something like that, OK. Again, I quote, Bavaro, you may recall, was the New York Giants' all-pro tight end during the latter half of the 1980s. Powerful, smoldering, blue-collar and deeply Catholic, he was custom-tailored for New York's gritty self-image, and now he's decided to stretch out and try his hand at writing a novel concerning a powerful, smoldering, blue-collar, blue -collar, deeply Catholic tight end for the New York Giants. Call it semi-fiction. So we'll hear more about this, and maybe saw some more about his present addiction to golf, um, with which I sympathize. And I know that between us, we have at most two good working knees, which may be something to do with it. OK. I'm also going to ask Mark to make predictions about the Patriots' season prospects. And these are predictions from his experience, I'm sure, and from his background, you'll safely be able to take to the bank if you can find one that isn't in receivership. All right, Mark, it's all yours. So this is yours. Yeah, clip it on. All right, well, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, as a New York giant, uh, I really didn't expect anybody to be here. <laughs> so this is a pleasure. Uh, let me just start a little bit. I'll tell you a little bit about the book. Um, it's a novel. It, it, it is, uh, there are autobiographical aspects to it. Uh, for instance, there is a crazy, doped up uh, linebacker <laughs> in the story. But again, um, you know, I think uh, almost every NFL team has one of those sometimes more. So um, as a giant, if anybody knows anything about the Giants, especially back in the day, you know, you're going to find uh, comparisons with some of those old players, which a lot of Giant fans are, are starting to make. But the truth of the matter is uh, the characters do have certain aspects of guys I played with, but they are all just composites of uh, many guys that I play with, not just on the Giants, but on the on the Philadelphia Eagles, the Cleveland Browns, at the University of Notre Dame, 
uh, and even at Danvers High School where I played. Uh, for some reason, football teams, uh, uh, they breed a lot of very interesting people uh, that you can use in writing afterwards. So the main, the, the main character of the book, is, his name is Dominic Fusillo. He's a tight end for the New York Giants. Uh, not much of a stretch, I admit, but this is my first book. I'm not that good of a writer that I can't go out beyond myself, so I stuck with what I knew, uh, and what I know is football, especially tight end, uh, and especially New York. So he's the main character, and he's going through uh, a, a career-ending knee injury. And it's kind of a strange injury in that he's allowed to play, the, he's allowed to play out the, the remainder of the season, knowing that his career is going to come to an end at the end of the season. So that's very un unique because guys usually blow their knees out and they're done. You know, it's kind of cut and dry. So he's going through sort of a football purgatory where he has, you know, two or three months to think about the end and all the anxieties and the stresses that, that go along with that. Uh, so while this is happening to him, other uh, because this is a novel, that, that part of the book is kind of truthful, but that in itself is not interesting enough uh, to fill the pages of a book. So the novel part of it comes in when he finds out things about his teammates, his coaches, his uh, friends that he hangs out with off the field, and his girlfriend that he was previously unaware of because he was so focused on football that he never took the time to, to look up and see what was going on around him. So these problems just compound his problems. Uh, it, it adds to his stress, adds to his anxiety, adds to all kinds of things, and, and he, he sees things that he never saw before. And there's corruption, there's scandal, there's uh, intrigue, there's gambling, there's all kinds of things in there. Because again, it is a novel, and while some of the things may be far-fetched, if you, if you ever read it, maybe far-fetched, all these things are plausible from uh, my experiences. They are things that could happen, could easily happen. Sometimes I wonder why they haven't happened before. Maybe they have happened, you just, you just don't know about it. Uh, so that's the gist of the book. So there's a lot of football in the book. As it starts off with football, it ends with football, there's a lot of football in the middle, but ultimately it's, it's a really, it's a thriller just set in the football world. And the main thrust of the story is just about this not so young guy, because he's 30 years old, in the, in the NFL that's old, but in real life he's still a young guy. So it's, it's about this not so young guy finally growing up, uh, maturing, taking responsibilities for his actions, and taking control of his life. So that's the book. Now, I wrote it uh, in 1999. Uh, for any aspiring writers out there, uh, it's not easy. I, I, I finished it in a year. Uh, I thought it was a masterpiece. I thought people were going to scoop it up, especially with, with my name, because back in 99, I wasn't that far removed from, from the NFL. I still, had a, I, had, I still had a pretty good name in the, in the football world. But uh, rejection letters proved otherwise. So, uh, and, at, and at this time, I was working different jobs, because while I did make decent money in the NFL, it wasn't like it was today. You know, I still needed to, uh, to work. Um, and being a, an ex-football player, if you, if you ever find any of these guys, they have trouble focusing on things. Uh, it's hard making a commitment to something besides football, because football was so all-encompassing. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was your life. And when that ended, uh, to go and work in an office, you know, or to try to start a business. Like I know a lot of, guys, a lot of my buddies started franchises, like GNCs, things like that. I mean, I, mean I, I don't know how you devote the same type of energy and devotion to the real world as, as you do to football. So I struggled going from one job to another. So in between my jobs, um, I would pull out the manuscript. I would work on it, because it was close to 600 pages. Um, and then I would send off letters. They come back, reject it again. I put it away. I get frustrated. I put it away. Uh, and I, I would concentrate on whatever job I happen to be doing at the moment. As soon as I lost interest in that job, you know, I'd pull out the manuscript again, do the same thing. So I was on this, like, I was on a, a wheel, you know, just going round and round. Uh, and if it wasn't for my wife, uh, who kept encouraging me to do something with it, you know, I probably would have given up on it a long time ago. But she continued to encourage me. Uh, 
and to the point where she started sending out letters without my knowledge because uh, I was tired of being rejected, you know. I'm like, hey, I'm not, <laughs> you can't just say no to me. Um, so finally, we got one, just one guy, one agent, one young literary agent in New York, took an interest in it, uh, asked to represent me. I said, sure. And he uh, said, okay, look, the manuscript, the story's great, all right, but the manuscript needs work because what you need is an editor. And I was like, I don't want anybody messing around with my, my book, my baby. He goes, look, everybody needs an editor. And you haven't been getting anywhere on your own, so it's up to you. Make a decision. So I said, sure. So we, we shopped around for editors. I interviewed a bunch of them. I found one guy down in uh, Westport, Connecticut, an older gentleman, a big giant fan. So that made me feel comfortable. Um, and he also happened to be Robert Ludlum's editor and Robert Ludlum's early years. So I was thinking, well, maybe the guy knows what he's doing. So he took it. He took, you know, he took the 600 pages or so, started just slashing and cutting. I mean, it, would just, it just came back, whole pages just X'd out. And I was like, <laughs> don't you realize how, how important this is? This? But it didn't matter. It didn't have anything to do with the story. You know, I had a lot of learning to do because I never really took creative writing classes. I just wanted to write. Uh, so he taught me how to stay on, on, uh, on message, you know. Here, here, he goes, here are the storylines. You've got, you got great storylines throughout the book, but they get lost in your, in your digression. So he got rid of all those things, uh, and now it's like 312 pages. It reads quick. It's fast. You know, I grew up reading Charles Dickens and, you know, all those classics, and, uh, you know, I was used to putting in, you know, a good 50 pages into the book, you know, before you even know what the story was about. You know, it was work. You know, reading was work. But you had time ba back in the old days before the Internet and computers. You know, he made me realize people don't have that attention span anymore. You've got to get right to the point. You've got to stay on the point, And you've got to you finish right on point with, without a whole lot of, you know, crap in between. Mm -hmm. So that's what he did. I mean, he just basically he, he, he cut out uh, a lot of non-essential things that I, you know, I still think are great, interesting stories. But... Um, didn't have anything to do really do with the plots, you know. So, and this is the product we have. It's a 312-page uh, thriller, basically set in, set in the football world, with great insights uh, as far as football goes. Uh, and what I think I bring to a football book that, you know, maybe some other authors who write about football don't is that, you know, it actually played. So a lot of my, a lot of the scenes in my book come from from inside the helmet, all right? Uh, and the, the other guys, like sports writers who write books, I mean, they can do a great job of, of, of creating a football world, and, and they have done a great job. But to, to, in order to get the, the inner thoughts and the, and the work, the mindset working of a player, I mean, you, got, you have to have gone through it. Uh, and that's why um, when I was in high school, um, I read North Dallas 40 by Peter Gent. I don't know if, if any of you remember that book. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the, the end all of, of all football novels. I was a teenager, and I read it, and I was completely enthralled. I, I wanted nothing more, and it was a pretty dark picture of the NFL that, that this guy Peter Gent uh, painted. There was nothing more, though, after reading it that I wanted to do was than to play in the NFL. I didn't care. You know, I didn't care about all all the, you know, whatever, the, the, the medicines you needed to take, the injuries, just the getting treated, uh, you know, badly, getting cut, or being treated like cat. It's like, this is great, you know, for some reason it appealed to me. Uh, and, and that's what my novel brings, brings to the reader. It gives you a really good inside look of, of the day-to-day -day workings of being uh, an NFL player, uh, along with, you know, the fictitious parts that make it an interesting story. Uh, Peter Gent was, was a, a wide receiver for the Dallas Cowboys. He played with Don Meredith, uh, Roger Staubach. He was a great player. And, you know, he was my inspiration. When I read that book, uh, I said, geez, if I can ever, because even at that time I still wanted to write, if I could ever play in the NFL, I would love to be able to write about it afterwards, just like he did, and not in an autobiographical form or in a memoir form but in a novel form because 
I mean, real life's, real life's okay, but you know, it's fun creating and just making stuff up. I mean, you can, you can just do whatever you want. And that's one of the things I've always enjoyed about writing is, you know, it's your world. You know, I can finally control, you know, the world around you. Uh, and I think that's what writers get out, of, get out of writing, especially novelists. They can just, they can make up whatever they want people to say, make up uh, the circumstances around it, you know. It's just, it was just a lot of fun, and I, and I enjoyed it. So it was a long process. Those are the reasons why I, I wrote it. Um, I think you'll enjoy it. If you like sports, uh, you'll, you'll enjoy it. It's a good book, and, uh, and that's it. Now, if uh, anybody has any questions about uh, football, which I'm sure you guys do, uh, I'd be more than happy to answer them. So, quick, quick introduction to Aaron Schatz, who's, who's with us now, and I'm very pleased too. He's a graduate of Brown, uh, lives in Framingham, and is a busy journalist writing for the New York Sun, the New York Times, New Republic Online, and ESPN, of course. Uh, I'm not sure, and I haven't asked him, what his playing experiences were and whether they channeled him into the, his ch chosen livelihood. Um, maybe we'll find out. Uh, his, one of his greater claims to fame was, the, was being the founder of uh, footballoutsiders.com, which many of you will know. Website started in 2003, uh, which specialized with it, specializes with its panel of regular reporters in the sort of weirdly advanced statistical analysis, once upon a time reserved for fanatics of baseball and cricket, I have to say. Okay, um, it's now exclusive with exclusively with ESPN, and is living proof that those math classes are never wasted. Okay, um, so he's going to talk about, amongst other things, the latest edition of his now required reading, Pro Football Prospectus. Aaron. <laughs> exact opposite story. All right. Thank you. <laughs> the total opposite. I believe that my football playing experience consists of touch football in sixth grade. I do think I scored once. Um, not to mention I was late. Did, Mark, did you ever play for Coughlin at any time? Yeah. Yeah. I got here and I said, he must have been 30 minutes early because he played for Coughlin. And you just get used to it probably for the rest <laughs> of your life. But apparently you only got here a little bit before me. By the way, Mark, I was going to put, it's like the draw. Yeah, it'll be like that year that the Vikings passed on their pick because they ran out of time. Um, so this is very different. The obviously opposite story, obviously. The site is called Football Outsiders specifically because I never played. When we got started, I didn't know anybody in the game at all. I was just a fan who had some questions about why things happened in the NFL. And uh, having been a fan of Bill James and all of the baseball sabermetrics guys who did advanced statistics like Rob Dyer and Baseball Prospectus, I said, it's really kind of weird. Nobody's doing this for football in any way that is not associated with gambling. And I'm going to go out there. I'm going to screw around with some numbers a little bit and see what I can find out. And I never played, and I'm very honest about the fact that, you know, uh, there's lots of things about football that I can't possibly know having never played. And in fact, none of our writers ever played past high school, although we do have a strange collection of Division Three relief pitchers, which is a little odd for a football site. But, um, it all basically started uh, back in uh, 02 with Ron Borges, like, like most things. And uh, if you remember the 02 season, the Patriots did not make the playoffs that year. And Borges was still writing for the Globe at the time, having not ripped off Mike Sando yet. And uh, wrote that the Patriots were going to miss the playoffs that year and not repeat as Super Bowl champions because they couldn't establish the run. At the same time, Borges was writing that the Oakland Raiders were his favorite to win the Super Bowl. And so as a fan, I said, this doesn't make any sense. Oakland ran less than any other team. That was when they had Charlie Garner as their running back, who was basically, you know, a pass catcher. So I decided that in the spirit of Bill James, the way Bill James got started back in the early uh, late 70s was that he wanted to know how catchers affected stolen bases. So he actually went through all the box scores in the sporting news, and he counted how many stolen bases were in each game with each catcher and figured out which catchers had the best arms. 
So I did the same thing. I went through all the games and counted how many runs teams had in the first quarter and the first half and compared it to winning to see whether it had any effect on their winning or not, which it didn't. It turned out that the amount that you run early on in a game does not affect your winning at all. You have to run well. You have to gain yardage. It's not just, you know, the classic is establish the run, show them that you want to run. Even if you only get a couple of yards per carry, you've established that you're running. Now it's, you know, you can't play all pass all the time or else the other team knows what you're going to do. That's called the Patriots Super Bowl strategy, and it didn't work. But, uh, you know, it's not enough to be like back at the time, Eddie George was the guy who they would literally run him into the ground in the first quarter to prove that they were establishing the run and then have to be saved by Steve McNair for the other three quarters. So uh, once I had done this, I sort of had pasted all of the plays into a spreadsheet, and I ended up doing passes too and special teams and realized now I had this amazing spreadsheet of every play in the NFL from 2002, and what could I do with it? And that's how this all started. Um, the basic uh, drive of the stats that we do is uh, to eliminate context and look at things situationally, which I discovered is really much more the way that coaches think about football. If you've ever seen uh, an NFL films, you know, show Belichick at a Patriots practice, he's always like, what's the situation? What's the situation? Know the situation. It's third and one. It's second and long. What do you do here? You're in the red zone. What do you do here? So our stats look at every play individually and then look at how successful they are, both in terms of a touchdown and a first down, which is really the most underrated statistic in football. We always hear about yards and touchdowns, but we never hear about first downs. And first downs you have to have, because otherwise you'll never get close to making it a touchdown. So uh, they grade plays differently. You know, If you have a third and three and you have a first and 10, a five yard run is very different on the two, especially if you have, say, a third and three and a second and 15. A five yard run on a second and 15 is a flop. But a five yard run on a third and three is a big success. We adjust for the opponents. This is how we put together our basic statistics. And we've expanded from there into a number of different things that kind of are context independent. Some of the findings that we've had, like for example, uh, the fact that fumble recovery is essentially random and non-predictive for the future. So our statistics filter out the number of fumbles that you recover and they only penalize you or reward you for defense for the number of fumbles you cause. Uh, and a lot of other things. Uh, and then a second group of statistics that we started collecting three years ago with a group of volunteer game charters uh, to make up for the fact that a lot of the things that we wanted to measure are not in the standard NFL play-by-play. -play. Standard NFL play-by-play -play is really weak compared to baseball. So we started the game charting project to try to track a lot of different things like what formations teams were running and how successful they were, when teams were successful using play action, when they uh, curried a quarterback, pressured a quarterback, as opposed to just sacked the quarterback. Uh, defensive coverage for defensive backs rather than simply tackles. You can't use tackles to judge a defensive back because normally the defensive back is making a tackle after he just let the guy catch a pass, which is, you know, unless the pass was for two yards on third and ten, probably a failure. What? Oh, well, Roy Williams wasn't half bad last night. <laughs> um, not last night, two nights ago. Got burned by Deshaun Jackson a couple of times. Well, now, now. He's not the best coverage safety. Uh, Deshaun Jackson is very fast, even if he doesn't know when to drop the ball and when to not drop the ball and <laughs> dance. Uh, so uh, obviously, that's going to be limited by the fact that we're working off television angles, uh, which simply do not reveal as much as we would like to see. Uh, in fact, even if we had the coach's film that revealed everything we would want to see, it would still be imperfect because you cannot judge whose responsibility a play was truly unless you know what the play call was. And unless I'm working for a team and the coordinators want to tell me, which I could never actually be working for all 32 simultaneously, we wouldn't know that. But we do the best that we can to try to you know, create objective like measurements of things. So when I started all of this five years ago, I knew a couple of people in the business because of my old job. I was sort of like a PR flack for the Lycos internet uh, search engine. Um, I said some, some articles. People thought it was kind of interesting, didn't know what, you know what to do with it. We started our own website. And uh, Michael Lewis was nice enough about two months before I started to write this book called Moneyball, which made everybody in the world interested in advanced sports statistics of every kind. And so everybody went looking for the money ball of you name it. And by the way, the money ball of cricket is still out there waiting to be done. 
It is my theory that that would be the next big thing to do because they have so many stats. If somebody, if there was some, you know, Indian kid in America who fell in love with my site and Bill James and stuff, they could make a lot of money. Uh, so people really started to get into it. We got, to, got noticed by Peter King and we got noticed by Greg Easterbrook and um, I got laid off in February of the next year. <laughs> Uh, sometime uh, I can tell everybody about what it was like to ride the tech bubble from the top down. Uh, and by around September, I had enough writing gigs to go off unemployment. This has been my job ever since. So we wrote for ESPN for the first year, Fox then for a couple of years. We're now back with ESPN. Uh, I had a number of people contact me starting from the very beginning. It started out with just me and a couple of my fraternity brothers. but. Uh, I've had a couple of people contacted me in the meantime and uh, we put together a staff. It's now about a dozen guys. We've even had people move on from us to bigger things. Michael David Smith is probably the best known. He's the second in command now at ProFootballTalk.com. Writes for AOL, wrote for the New York Times during the draft. Uh, we just, high, just brought on my second full-time person who is a Northeastern graduate by the name of Bill Barnwell, uh, who's uh, not here but is coming later. Uh, and uh, basically, this has been a wonderful ride of being able to watch football for a living. And the game that I love, uh, finally start to make some connections in the game, learn about scouting, learn about what players see, learn about what coaches see, which helps to make my, uh, helps to make my work a lot more holistic and accurate to combine the statistics with what really happens on the field. Because statistics alone are not going to give you the real view of what goes on. They give you a little bit of a view, but if you can picture in your head what's going on on the field that the statistics explain, you get a better idea of when they're meaningful and when they're not meaningful. Um, and I've, I've done work for a couple of teams and it's just all been really good. So, um, is this water for me, Ma? Yeah. All right, thanks. Um, thirsty, excuse me. So, uh, in general, I, I generally just take questions also talking about the season, but I know a lot of people, I'm sure the first question will be, so I'll just hit it right off, which is what uh, do I think about the Patriots with Tom Brady out for the year? Now, our projections for this year, which include a ridiculous number of variables, all kinds of things, performance in different situations last year, experience at certain positions, uh, injury record for each team, and so forth, had the Patriots as the best team in the league, bar none, 99, we, we simulate the season 10,000 times, assigning each team a, a random value of how good they are based on what our projections say is the likely you know. Because in football, with only 16 games, with more change from year to year in the rosters than any other sport, with more randomness going into wins and losses than any other sport, uh, particularly because of the fact that there's only 16 of them, uh, there's going to be a lot more natural variation from year to year. It's going to be harder to predict. Doesn't mean we can't try. Just means it's harder than baseball, for example. But when we ran those simulations, the Patriots ended up with at least nine wins in 99% of them, and at least 11 wins in 79%, and were the best team by far, and had, of course, one of the two best players in the league. Now, they don't. So what happens then? The interesting thing is that when you go back and look in recent history, it's amazing how losing a superstar quarterback doesn't kill teams. Now, teams rarely lose a super, uh, superstar quarterback of the quality of Tom Brady. The closest is probably when Denver lost John Elway for half the season in 1998, but at that point he was the 37-year-old John Elway. He was not as good as Brady or Manning are now, or as good as he was when he was in his late 20s. Um, but teams generally do not collapse. They brought in Bubby Brister, who had, by our numbers, been the worst quarterback in the league three years before with the New York Jets in 1995. And uh, he was fine. He was one of the top quarterbacks in the league, but not as good as Elway. Won enough games to get them back into the playoffs. Elway was healthy, and they won their second Super Bowl. Elway marched off into the sunset, and we didn't have to go through the Hamlet routine every year like we do with Brett Favre. Um, the Jets, with Testaverde getting injured on the first game of the season in 99, were terrible with Rick Myrer. But when Ray, uh, Lucas became the quarterback for the second half of the year, I believe they were 5-2. and two. So they were, you know, if you have a terrible, horrible backup quarterback, you're in trouble. The Eagles have lost Donald McNabb for a large part of two different seasons. In one of them, the backups were Mike McMahon uh, and uh, uh, Coy Detmer, and they were horrible. In the other one, the backup was Jeff Garcia, and they were fine. They went to the playoffs. In fact, people began to think Garcia was better than McNabb because they won more games. In actuality, they had an easier schedule and better luck in the second half of the season. They were just as good in the first half of the season with McNabb that year. 
Garcia took over a ship that was already doing pretty well and just happened to do as well, in fact, not as well. He did not play as well as McNabb had in the first half of the year. He's not as good a quarterback as McNabb. And if you don't believe me, ask John Gruden, who's trying to get rid of him right now. Um, but you know, over and over again, you see these. Culpepper had one of the greatest quarterback seasons of all time in 04. 05, he's bad the first couple games, gets injured. Brad Johnson comes in, and he's OK. Not as good, but OK. Um, trying to think of the other ones in recent time. Obviously, Bledsoe is an example. Tom Brady of 2001 was not the Tom Brady of now, but he was fine. So with that in mind, I think that the Patriots are not cooked. They were never cooked, even from the first, you know, even before they beat the Jets this week. There was no feeling that they were cooked. They were still the favorites to win the division, not to win the Super Bowl anymore. But they have the easiest schedule in the league. Maybe not now because uh, part of them having the easiest schedule in the league is that they were so hard to beat that it made the other teams in their division look like they had a harder schedule. And now, obviously, they're a little weaker. But that whole AFC East has a very easy schedule because they play the two Western divisions, which are just horrible. Um, the NFC West may end up having a champion that doesn't even have a winning record this year. So with that in mind, it's very likely the Patriots will go 10-6 and six or 11-5 and five with Matt Castle at quarterback. They will probably win their division, which I think has to be seen as a successful season. I doubt they'll make it to the Super Bowl. I doubt they'll win the Super Bowl because this really looks like the year where the NFC has finally drawn even with the AFC. Uh, and doesn't need a big, like, out-of-nowhere victory like the Giants, you know, last year, that they'll legitimately be better over the course of the season with Green Bay and Philadelphia and Dallas and maybe even the Giants, who are actually number one in our ratings after two weeks. Um, and it'll be a successful season, and uh, then Tom Brady will come back next year, and the team will win 15 games again. Well, probably not that many because they don't get to play the two Western divisions. So that answers probably the most likely question, and I'll take other questions with Mark <laughs> afterwards. Did you play with the team that Sims? Speaking of backup quarterbacks who did well. Yeah, we lost. Um, we lost Phil Sims mid-season, late late season actually. We were, I think, we were ten and zero, something like that at the time. Um, uh, but there was never really much panic on the team because you got to remember this is before free agency. You know, we, we had a good solid team, uh, and the quarterbacks that we had on our roster had been with us forever. You know, we had Jeff Hostetler who had played for us. I mean, we had taken thousands of reps from Jeff, uh, so he wasn't an unknown quantity. It wasn't like we weren't sure how he was going to play once he got in, got into the starting lineup. So. When he, he stepped on the field, there was, there was no drop in confidence in the huddle. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, he actually was a little bit, he was much more mobile than Phil Simms. Uh, and he, he brought another dimension to the team that I think, um, if, if people remember back then, uh, we're playing the Buffalo Bills. I'm not sure if we would have been able to beat uh, the, the Bills in the Super Bowl if, if, we didn't, if our quarterback didn't have that mobility. Which Phil Sims will tell you he did, but he really didn't. <laughs> it's actually a lot like Brady and Castle, if you think about it. Castle is the more mobile of the two, yep. uh, and he, you know, makes up for the fact that he doesn't have as strong an arm and doesn't make quite as good decisions as Brady with the fact that he can't scramble when necessary, which Brady really can't do, uh, unless he's going up against Brian Urlacher for some reason. Which is <laughs> uh, would you say that it'd be more beneficial to lose a quarterback at the beginning of the year? That's a good question. I mean, depends. You know, if you have, it could work both ways. I really don't know the answer for that. That's probably a better question for you than me because that's more about sort of the reps and the timing and the personalities of the locker room and stuff. I would say in today's league, it's probably you're better off losing a quick and, and letting this guy, letting the new guy get some experience because in today's game, the backup quarterbacks in the league just don't have much experience anymore. Simmons and Greg Easterbrook got into a fight, which one would you pick? Seeing how they're both good to you, but you have to pick. Whoa. Which one would you that. pick? Sorry. Whoops. Oh, in a fight? Yeah. Oh, it's no question. Bill Simmons is like 20 years younger than Greg Easterbrook. Well, no. Like, who would you support, though? Like, seeing how, like, uh, Greg Easterbrook's always been great to you guys and everything. But then again, he's a Patriots hater, and uh, Bill Simmons. If I, had to, if I had to pick one, what is a better writer? Or no, like, 
Who do you like better, pretty much? At this point, <laughs> with no disrespect to Greg, I do feel that his column has become quite repetitive. And in particular, I really don't see the need for him to put his political writing in his football column. All right, good. I would rather read pop cult, the pop culture thoughts of Bill Simmons along with the football than the political ramblings. We have a no politics rule at Football Outsiders. I have a lot of very strong political views, and nobody knows what they are, <laughs> because it's very important to us that nobody feel like they cannot come to our site because their political views happen to be different than any of us who write for the site. Also, uh, actually, coaching freshman football at my high school at Bridgewater Lake Camp. And I was wondering, could you get, is there any pointers that I could give to my young tight ends? Uh, anything, Mark? Uh, that's a good question, too. It's a good question uh, for Aaron. I, I was talking about um, keeping stats. I'd like, uh, when are you going to keep stats on blocking for tight it's ends? It's hard. That's the problem, is it's very hard with TV angles, so we're sort of stuck scouting like everyone else. We've tried especially because we have a group of volunteers that to, to add the ad getting run blocking stats is of particularly given television camera angles is very difficult. I mean, we take that into account when we talk about who the best tight ends are. When someone asks me who's the best tight end of the game, it's a very easy question at this point to answer. It's Jason Witten. Because of the best receiving tight ends, which would be him and Gates, and then slightly below probably Winslow and Gonzalez, of those four, he is the best blocker, clearly. And it is there are two roles. It's just we only have stats for one. That doesn't make the other one not important. Right. But that's what I would. I would probably make sure the tight end knows how to block, teach right. him blocking techniques, and right. make make sure that he knows that blocking is probably eighty, sometimes more percent of the game. Right. You know, you catch you catch two or three balls a game as a tight end, um, you're doing okay. What's you know, recording? That's only two or three oh, plays. Yes. Like seven. Sorry, she needs us to speak into this because that's actually what's recording for. Sorry about that recording, people. We apologize profusely. <laughs> yeah, uh, Mark, just some questions about uh, three people that you were around with on a personal basis. Uh, just a quick little summary. Uh, Belichick, Parcells, and LP. Just your thoughts on that. Besides like, the stuff we usually hear about how you know, Parcells is uh, you know, strict and how Belichick's bound to be. Your personal thoughts. Well, I mean, that's, that's basically all it is because they, really they don't really do much else. Besides football, you know, it's hard to, to tell you much about them off the field or outside the locker room because inside they're just like what you see on TV. They're, they're very strict. Uh, you have to do your job. They demand a lot from their players, uh, especially Belichick. Uh, y you have to be smart. You know, with Parcells, you had to be smart, but you had to really be tough. You know, he wanted he he wanted those type of players. He wanted smart, tough players. Bill, you know, I th sometimes I think he sacrifices the toughness for the smarts because I think they do have a, a sophisticated game plan, much more sophisticated uh, than when I played for Bill Parcells. Um, and I think that that was one of the reasons they lost the Super Bowl last year because uh, on paper, and I, you know, I agree, they were the best team by far in the league. But, um, you know, the one factor that, that they don't take into account is what happens when you get the shit kicked out of you. You know, and that's what happened. They, the Giants came in and just beat the crap out of the Patriots, and how do you counter that? You know, as it turned out, yeah. And who would have thought? Who would have thought? And um, and the last guy, Lawrence Taylor, greatest teammate in the world. For all the trouble, all the negative stories you hear about him, he never brought that stuff into the locker room. I don't care what his book says or what he says. If he did, it wasn't noticeable to to his teammates. He wasn't a prima donna. Um, Parcells yelled at him just like he yelled at everybody else. Uh, he took his medicine. He gave encouragement. He didn't walk around like he was above everything, like some of these guys you see today. Uh, he wasn't outspoken. I mean, he wasn't doing endorsements. He wasn't doing uh, TV shows. He, he played football. I mean, that's, that's all Lawrence Taylor was. He was a football player, and he was the best. Um, the contrast between him and some of these guys today is ridiculous. These so guys. Oh, his. Yeah, we never even called him LT. We always called him Lawrence. You know, I think his buddies outside called him uh, LT, and in most of the trouble he got into was from from guys he hung around with. By the way, I, I'd, uh, I'd just say in reference to the Patriots last year and Belichick's sort of philosophy. I don't know about toughness, but he definitely gives up speed for smarts. You definitely see with the age of the defense and bringing in guys who are in their 30s, even after guys who are in their 30s get injured, that he is willing to give up speed for smarts on defense. And I do think that that 
does hurt them at times. That might be your toughness right there. <laughs> I kept waiting for it, the draw play, and Maroney's good at, at avoiding guys. When you get that sort of gap in the middle that comes from running a draw, he's very shifty, and they never ran one, and I have no idea why. As far as what his problem might be, I mean, I don't know. Do you know anything about one comparing running backs? Because, I mean, there definitely seems to... In the press, there's a lot of questioning of his toughness, and he clearly is one of those guys who his body is just more susceptible to injury than other people's. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> like we said before, who knows, who knows why coaches do what they do. You've got to be in the meetings, and he obviously there's something about him. He doesn't want him running, or you got me. He's a good running back. Yeah. It, it's honestly one of the hardest parts of my job because part of my job as I've become more famous and our, we've become a larger site is doing fantasy football projections. And doing fantasy football projections are heavily dependent upon usage of players. I mean, obviously, all injuries also. But to read these guys' minds about who they are going to use is impossible, especially if they're Mike Shanahan. And... It's a very difficult part of our job. In baseball, the only equivalent, really, is figuring out who the closer is going to be on some teams. But other than that, I mean, you know who's in the lineup, and those guys get at bats. In football, you don't know. I mean, why don't – why last year did the Atlanta Falcons send Warwick Dunn out there to get three yards of carry twice as often as they sent Jerry Norwood out there to get six? I understand Norwood's not as good a blocker, but come on. So there's all kinds of things like that that we don't know, and they probably have a lot to do with the kinds of things that, A, statistics don't measure, and B, we just don't see. They have to do with the locker room. And then C, coach stubbornness. Patriots hat guy. Um, now I'm forgetting my question. <laughs> well, we have to pass it back and forth, though. Oh, but this was oh, a question. This was right. a question for you. We have no uh, idea what we're doing with this. It was, uh, well, All right. Uh, that guy. Giants hat guy. Uh, I do I do think that they're better off without him. I think he's a great athlete. He's a great tight end. Um, but I think he was a, a nuisance to Eli, especially, you know, being such a young guy, uh, expecting him to be the leader of the team, it was kind of hard for him to overcome such a big personality as, as Jeremy. I think Jeremy is, is actually going to be happier down in New Orleans. Uh, he's got Sean Payton down there, uh, who, who was his original coach at the Giants. Uh, he's going to use them. He's going to throw the ball to them, and that's what he wants. He wants to catch balls. He doesn't really want to block. Uh, you know, the Giants, you have to block. And he's, he, I mean, he's a great receiver. So I think it works out best for both teams, for both people. He's a good blocker. Somebody should tell me he should do it a lot. Uh, I also think, see, I don't know about the, what the clubhouse, I don't know if he's really that much of a jerk. You never know if the media is right about these things. But... Uh, he specializes in the kind of roots that Eli is not good at throwing. And Boss specializes in the kind of roots that Eli is good at throwing. So part of it was that. Eli just the kind of shorter, like hooky things, he just was better at that than the like let's go up the seam kind of deals. And so they were going to call more stuff with Boss because that happens to be what Eli Manning is better at. And Breeze is better at the kind of stuff that Shockey, well Breeze is better at both, but uh, he fits the Saints. He, Better, I, do, I definitely think that. Um, okay, Patriots High, we'll give you another chance. <laughs> well, first, maybe if you start giving people credit for blocking, then Jeremy might want to do it a little bit more often. But, you know, well, I don't think I'm the one who gets the <laughs> talk in the media about that. <laughs> Let's call up, well, we could call up uh, uh, Jimmy Johnson, Howie Long, and Bill Cowher. And but how would you feel, um, how do you, like, who do you think is your biggest critic? I mean, actually, I just heard on the radio yesterday, uh, local radio that really was. Uh, oh, you mean EEI going off on Casey Joyner? Uh, I'm not sure. Is that what they weren't going off on me. No, they were going off on Casey Joyner for really guy? stupid reasons. But, um, <laughs> who would you say is your biggest critic as far as, like you said, that one of the hardest part is that you, know, you, you really don't know what the play was to begin with? So readers. 
Readers, people criticize me a lot more than people who are in the league. I mean, the people I've talked to in the league uh, generally understand what we're trying to do. Some of them really like it. Others are not really that excited about it because of the, because of the um, limitations. But I've been very, it's very important to me, it's been very important to me through the entire process to be very clear that we understand our own limitations because the baseball people who do what I do kind of charged into the world in the 80s pretending they knew everything and could run a team better than anyone else who was running it at the time. And people in, in, the, in the league were idiots. And I really don't want that reputation, particularly because I don't believe those things. So I wouldn't want people uh, thinking that I believe those things. I will say that uh, when meeting Bruce Allen from the Bucks, he said that John Gruden uh, hates me. <laughs> but I don't know if that's really true. Why should, why should he hate you? I don't know, because I always thought Gruden was the kind of cutting edge guy who'd kind of dig what I do. But who you knows? You always project them well in your books. I do always project them well. And you know what? What are they, 2-0? Yeah, you know. Well, in the last Well, by our numbers, which go back to 1995 at this point, they are the best regular season team ever. Well, what, about what I was saying in the middle of the year was you can't really statistically determine who the greatest team ever is because the question of how important the postseason is differs from person to person as a subjective issue of how what, what's the greatest team ever, how important the postseason is to you differs from, to me, the greatest team ever is the 1985 Chicago Bears because numerically they are one of the two or three greatest regular season teams ever, better than the Dolphins who had an easy schedule when they went perfect. Maybe not better than the Patriots, but in the playoffs where the Patriots had a couple close wins and then blew it, the Bears stomped the living crap out of everybody. And so to me, that's the best team of all time. But how much you favor the regular season over the postseason is not a statistical issue, it's an emotional one. Yeah, I mean, it depends on who the guy is. Obviously, it's going to have an effect. But, you know, the bottom line is everybody's got their own job to do. Uh, and there's, there's really not a whole lot of time to worry about what your teammates are doing. You know, whoever's in the huddle at the time, I mean, that's who you need to depend on. You can't worry about what the, what the guy's going to be doing next year or, you know, or what the guy's doing off the field. Um, I think it is some sort of a distraction. It's hard not to be a distraction, but I don't think it's as, as bad as... Uh, as some people make it out to be. At least it shouldn't be. Um, the question is whether I believe in Bill Simmons' Ewing theory. The Ewing theory is that a superstar team that is led by where one superstar is the focus of the entire team, when they get rid of that superstar, they tend to win. Um, I don't believe in it per se that that's the reason. It, no, I've never never done that, but I wouldn't have enough data to really do it for just football. And I mean, there's a lot of explanations for why teams win after the superstar goes. Sometimes it has to do with the fact that when the superstar goes, they can bring in more above average players to replace the superstar and a few guys who are below average. Sometimes it's just luck. You know, I mean, uh, I would say that the Giants, in the Giants case, it was just luck. It had nothing to do with, Tiki. it not. It was all luck. It had nothing to do with the fact that Tiki Barber wasn't there anymore. For example, that's one classic sort of classic. Ewing. I should have realized Bill Simmons writes the Ewing theory with Tiki Barber gone that that team would win. Well, let's be honest. Tiki Barber was not the entire focus of everything on, on coverage of that team. He had to share that with Strahan, and Shockey, and Eli Manning. Uh, and the other is that whatever you say about their march through the playoffs, it really had nothing to do with the fact that Tiki Barber wasn't there. The fact is that Tiki Barber is, for all we know, at least at this point, better than Ahmad Bradshaw. And Brandon Jacobs still would have been Brandon Jacobs, so I don't think it really matters. A journalism background because that's the way that I've tried to make it. 
when we looked for new writers a year ago, I specifically said, we did an open competition for new writers. And I specifically said, I don't care how good your research is. I need to know that you can use my stats in a story, but not that you can use stats in general, because there are plenty of people out there that can play around with spreadsheets, but we write, and I need people that are interesting to read. And I see myself as a writer first, not a statistician. Um, obviously, with adding the college football content that we've added over the last year or two, it's people that have their own rating systems and their own statistics, because I needed that, because I don't watch college football. Being from Boston, as I explained to people, if it doesn't have to do with Doug Flutie up here, no one cares. <laughs> but um, in general, I look for writers first who can understand what I'm doing. I mean, the other thing is we have stuff on our site that has no stats whatsoever. I mean, when Tanya diagrams plays, that's not stats. That's that's scouting and but he's informed by the stats when he does that stuff so uh, you know to be honest with you I didn't I never saw any of it you know there was strict testing uh, but every once in a while you would hear about one of your teammates getting caught fired uh, and that's the only time I, I ever uh, heard about it I would think steroid use is, is much more prevalent in your local neighborhood gym than it is in the NFL. But that's, you know, I could be co completely wrong on that. That's how I see it. Um, with the, like, short success of Aaron Rodgers here, there's been the debate again of the, how to best start a young quarterback, whether to leave him in the system for like three or four years or start him right away and speed up the learning curve. And just both of you, like, what are your opinions on that? Or do you think it holds any precedent? Don't know. Inconclusive. All research inconclusive. Uh, Ned Macy wrote a whole thing about it a few years ago. Now, obviously, we have three or more, four more years of evidence. Who the heck knows, honestly? Um, because the biggest thing that makes it difficult to figure out is that guys who are thrown into the fire early are usually thrown into the fire early on really bad teams. You cannot blame Matt Ryan for the fact that the Falcons are terrible when they are not playing Detroit. So... Um, I mean, I don't know about emotionally. I will say that from what you said about having the backup quarterback around for a couple of years before he finally gets in there, I would think the teammates would probably trust the rookie more if he wasn't a rookie, if it was like a guy like Rivers or Rodgers who had been around for a couple of years, but you tell me. Well, yeah, I think, well, Matt Castle is a perfect example. He, he's the closest thing you're going to get to pre-free agency uh, backup quarterbacks. I mean, that's just the way Bill Belichick runs his program. Uh, he doesn't lose many guys. Uh, but as far as Aaron Rodgers, I mean, I think it's a crime, in football terms anyways, that he never had any more playing time before this. You know, there's no reason why Brett Favre couldn't have uh, sat down a few series and they could have groomed him a little more. It's not like they didn't know the end of Brett Favre was coming. I and mean, the end of blowouts and stuff, you mean, right? Yeah, well, even, you know, maybe even in some critical situations, you know. Do you think it creates a problem for the other players if they... Uh being recorded as a receiver does it is it strange for you to have quarterback switch back and forth that was one of the questions it's never done in the nfl and last year when arizona began to switch back and forth between Leinart and warner based on the situation there was a question of how was that for the teammates was that weird for them i mean people just never do it so who knows what the effect is do you think that creates any kind of an effect that you don't have like one singular leader or do you I don't, I don't think that they should do that. I, I like this, so Ohio State, you know, switching uh, quarterbacks back and forth here. I think that's weird, as a player. I don't know how I would do that. Uh, down in Arizona, they obviously they're doing it because they have problems. But I think in the case of Green Bay with uh, with uh, Brett Favre, you knew the end was coming. I mean, it's 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 on the horizon. And if Aaron Rodgers was the guy that they they chose to take over. I think the last two or three years they could have gotten him some m more experience. Although he's, he seems to be doing just fine, you know. So maybe I, I'm completely wrong on this. But uh, I mean, if I was the coach, I would have gotten him in some more playing time than than he got. What victory shirt guy? Yeah. Um, I know you mentioned that like losing Brady, it, it didn't seem like it would, it would totally kill the Patriots. I know a lot of people have been debating whether Belichick or Brady is more important part of the um, sort of scheme. Are there any like metrics or any stats at all that would point towards? We are trying so hard, man. We have tried. We've played around with that. And uh, I'm actually probably going to a conference in, in uh, California in a, in a couple of weeks where a guy's presenting a paper that uses some sort of like 
game theory and psychological theory to try to determine coach effects or something. I have no idea. I probably won't even understand it. Uh, but I'm not quite as like mathematically uh, intricate as people seem to think I am. Uh, I don't have a master's degree in anything. But um, I mean, we, we haven't been able to measure coaching. I will say one of the theories that we have that kind of comes out in the San Diego chapter of this year's book is that while coaches in the NFL are no doubt more important than coaches in other sports, head coaches in other sports, a little bit of a theory that they might be a little overrated. When you look at like what happened with San Diego last year, there's no doubt North Turner has a terrible record. And obviously they did win their division and they did upset the Colts in a playoff game because they have so much talent on the field. But some of what we think about when we think of the great coaches of today is not coaching. It's general management decisions. A lot of what we think about when we think of the genius of Belichick is not Belichick the head coach. It's Belichick the general manager or whatever you would call his title of guy who works with Scott Pioli to f shape the roster in that way. To make decisions like we'll have a veteran and Castle for a couple years and then Castle will be ready. We won't need a veteran anymore. These are general management decisions, not coaching decisions. So it's possible that some that the coaches may be a little overrated today because we attribute general management to coaching, but then at the same time that doesn't answer the Belichick or Brady question. Uh, the guy next to him, and then is that the last one? No, I oh, sorry, a guy next to him, and then guy in charge who likes cricket. Because coaches have a, many coaches have a uh, out of proportion view of their own ability to teach technique to guys who are 22 years old and probably are kind of stuck in their ways mostly by that point. And I've actually had a coach in the NFL tell me that. I, I really think that, um, I definitely think that coaches should look more at what guys do on the field. Now listen, I mean there's some ways in which you can't because the college game is different from the pro game. And if you're trying to take a defensive end from college and turn him into an outside linebacker in a 3-4, just looking at tape is not going to help you purely because you're projecting a guy into a different position. And those kinds of metrics and those, those stuff from the combine is important as far as projecting guys into the NFL because it is a different game. The level is different. You can't get by on just your natural you know, certain things anymore because everybody's got that kind of ability. But I definitely think that I mean, I'm with the standard press in believing that the coaches pay too much attention to the combine and not enough to how guys actually played in college. And I agree. But, I mean, they need, they need something to measure these guys with, and that's what they have. Well, the interesting part about these tests, though, are, I mean, I went through some of them coming up into the pros, but they were, you know, all new. Uh, today, guys, they actually train for the combine. So you see, you know, these the scores getting better and better and better. Maybe they're better athletes, you know, but you know, maybe they're not. I think that they're just if if I had if I had trained for years to do the box drill or the 225 uh, bench press or whatever, you know, back I was I was they still had handheld watches when I was running the 40 back then. You know, these these things it's become it's become a sport of its own now the combine. So what are you going to do? I mean, you've got to figure out a way to measure these guys against the other guys, especially when you don't see them playing against each other. So. Like, like an SAT, stand that they can all look at. Yeah, and it probably comes in more handy if you're getting a guy like a Jari Evans who went to Division II Bloomberg. The other thing I'd say is what you said about the, the hiring the, the coaches and being prepared, that's why when guys are terrible at the combine, you really scratch your heads. I was at the combine the year Vince Young scored a six on the Wonderlick. And the response was not, Vince Young is an idiot. The response was, how on earth did Vince Young not hire a Wonderlick coach knowing he was a top five pick to coach him to get better than a six on the Wonderlick? I mean, it was less a question of whether he was an idiot and more a question of his commitment. Because the fact is, the Wonderlick is a swell, you know, whatever, IQ measurement. But what one of the guys, uh, Will Carroll, who writes uh, injuries for us and for Baseball Prospectus, lives in Indianapolis. And he said, you meet Edgar and James, he is like the dumbest person you have ever met in your life. <laughs> unless you talk football with him, and then he is like a Ron Jaworski level genius. And so the Wonderlick's not going to measure that about Edgar and James, the fact that the guy knows football because football is his life and whatever. 
But what having that low score, what meant for Young was that you questioned his commitment. And gee, it kind of turned out right to question his commitment. He also needs therapy. I'll say first, the, the, the amount of painkillers taken by guys in the NFL is absurd. There's actually an article about that in this year's Pro Football Prospectus. Um, there's no doubt that guys who make it to professional sports, that one of the genetic traits they have, usually, is not just strength, speed, and the spatial knowledge to understand roots type things, but an ability to withstand injury better. Lawrence Maroney seems to be missing this. So is Nick Johnson of the Washington Nationals. I mean, there's guys in various sports that have that problem. What's the name of the guy with the knee that the Celtics just signed? I don't know. Um, but Will's theory is that we have reached the breaking point with football players. They have become so big, so strong, and so fast compared to the average person or what the average player was like just 10 or 15 years ago that the kind of ridiculous injuries that we're seeing in the first couple of weeks have been absurd with the number of season ending injuries, especially if you're a Seattle Seahawks wide receiver, is like the natural sort of, we've hit a breaking point where just people can't get any faster and stronger without hurting each other. So the question is, is there a way to, with either rules or equipment to kind of dial that back a little bit because you don't want to see, I mean, you know guys are going to get injured sometimes, but you don't want to see after the first week where, hey, gee, Tom Brady's out for the season, and half the offensive line from Jacksonville is out for the season, and Seattle's down to their sixth receiver, and this is happening, and that is happening, and the other thing's happening. Bob Sanders is out for six weeks again, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you could tell me about all the painkillers, obviously, because you've got to take them. Yeah, I mean, injuries are part of the game. I mean, it happens. Uh and that's something you can't measure with guys, uh, their tolerance for pain, their, their ability to play through injuries. Um, it's, you know, there's just no test for it, but it's definitely one of the big, big parts. Painkillers, I mean, they're available to you if you, if you need them. Uh, you know, it, and it really depends on the personality of guys. I mean, I, <laughs> I play with some guys who, you know, they got their first prescription and they never got off it, you know, other guys, like me, I, I, uh, narcotics make me nauseous, so I didn't, I didn't, I didn't ever take them, not even after my operations, unless I, I really, really needed them. But uh, more than painkillers, I think, are the anti-inflammatories. Uh, those, those are the hidden, the hidden secret of the NFL. I mean, th that, those medicines, they make you feel great because they take all your inflammation down. Uh, there was one, this one anti-inflammatory called butazolidine. It was for horses, but they used to give them out to us, right, at some of the teams I was on. And I'll tell you what, it, you know, I was like 31 at the time. It made me feel like I was 22 again, you know. Um, but they rip up your insides. They, do, they do, do, do bad stuff to your stomach, to your whole digestive system. So I had stomach problems. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I couldn't uh, I c the last few years of my career, I couldn't have played with, without them, you know. And they're not... You know, they're not a bad drug. No one thinks of them as bad, but they're not good for you. Just a couple more questions, then there's some book signing and so we can do. Yeah, I was just wondering, Mark, uh, who do you think is the most underappreciated player of your of the late 80 <laughs> Giants? Like, uh, for instance, like, I know there are, everybody talks about LT and Sims and you. Like, is there any person who's underrated by the media now who attributed to their team's success? Well, I mean, the late 80s is so long ago that yeah. everybody's forgotten now, you know. But, I mean, we had some great players. Kyle Banks, Banks yeah, was unbelievable. Banks. Leonard Marshall, you know, Jim Burt. Don't even talk about Marshall. He ended Joe Montana's uh, career for two years. I don't want to even talk about him. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there was, there was a – and to, to what I think one of the most underrated players to, today that's, that's going to be forgotten is, Marsh, is uh, not Marshall Falk, but Kevin Falk. At the Patriots, you know, no matter what he does, all he does is great things, and yet people still think of him as like kind of a journeyman, you know. So I mean, he's the type of player that you know, five, ten years from now, you know, people are going to remember Tom Brady, people are going to remember Teddy Bruschi, you know, and then you're going to mention Kevin Falk and they go, oh yeah, that guy, he was great, you know. But he's not the type of guy that that lives on in memory, and uh, you know, the Giants were loaded with with those type of guys. One last question. 
Hi, we're the 2000 Baltimore Ravens. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> I mean, if, 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 if also Jackson had better receivers, you know, if Bernard Berrien was at number one, yeah, but if I didn't, with that, I mean, would they, um, yeah, I actually think that's the biggest difference between the two because the Ravens had, I mean, I'd say Kadri Ismail and, and Berrien were equivalent, but they had Shannon Sharp. But the, the Vikings are very similar to the 2000 Ravens. I mean, and I think they're going to end up similar. That defense is killer. But the secondary is not as good as the secondary was for the 2000 Ravens. Um, so that's one difference. They don't have a tight end like that. They have a better running back, but not that much better. I mean, Jamal Lewis, when he was a rookie, was not the beaten down Jamal Lewis of 05. He was, or the older and kind of wily Jamal Lewis of today. I mean, he was, you know, he was a stud. Um, so that's what the Vikings are like. And I don't know why they fell in love with this guy from a 1AA school in the first place who couldn't complete half his passes in 1AA. And I don't know why they didn't go out and get a better backup than Gus Farratt, who's like way over the hill. And I don't, I mean, if, if, if the problem is that when a guy, you know, wants to, when a head coach gets tired of his quarterback and gets to get in a bad mood, they don't want to trade him to a rival. So the, they were not going to let, Green Bay was not going to let Favre go there. And Gruden is not going to waive Jeff Garcia because of this weird, I have no idea why, all of a sudden I don't want to play Jeff Garcia anymore. But they're not going to let the Vikings have him because that's a colossal upgrade at the most important hole on that team. Um, but yeah, I mean, I have no idea why they decided to not fill that hole, but I don't know why Chicago decided not to fill their hole either. So they've got an amazing team in other places. Yeah, but then they went out this offseason, and they're like, wow, we know that Kyle Orton and Rex Grossman aren't any good. Let's not get anyone else. And it's possible that I'm wrong. I mean, Orton, we've only seen Orton as a rookie. He it's could be better many. than that. But, well, I mean, Greasy was out there. Apparently, he's now the starter in Tampa, so he was yeah. there for anybody to get. But, yeah, I mean, there are, I mean, you know, there aren't that many, but there were guys. I still don't quite understand the Culpepper thing. I don't understand quite why nobody will give him a shot. His retirement, you mean? Why nobody would give him a shot before his retirement. I think if you put him on a team with a good offensive line that could protect him, and he was convinced that he wasn't a scrambler anymore, I'd like to see what he could do. And a dozen other guys.